own aspirations to join the Western community of nations and live lives of dignity, helping them have the rule of law with strong institutions is the purpose of our policy. So in other words, it is a purpose of our foreign policy to encourage foreign nations to refrain from conducting political investigations. Is that right? Correct. And in fact, as a matter of policy, not of programming, uh, we oftentimes raise our concerns, usually in private, with countries that we feel are engaged in selective political prosecution and persecution of their opponents. Yovanovitch aptly summarized the global consequences and harm to U.S. national security resulting from President Trump's demand that Ukraine investigate his political opponent. Such conduct undermines the U.S., exposes our friends, and widens the playing field for autocrats like President Putin. Our leadership depends on the power of our example and the consistency of our purpose. Both have now been opened to question. The issues I just covered are not a matter, a matter of policy disagreement over foreign policy and national security. Article 1 asserts that the President was engaged in no such policy at all, but instead sold out our policies and our national interests for his own personal gain and to help him corrupt the next election. That is the core conduct of an impeachable offense. The President's abuse of power also affected our election integrity. The framers of our Constitution were particularly fearful that a President might misuse or abuse the power of his office to undermine the free and fair elections at the heart of our democracy. Sadly, that moment has arrived. President Trump's repeated solicitation of a Ukrainian investigation was a clear effort to leverage foreign interference to bolster his prospects in the 2020 election. In other words, to cheat in his election. In our democracy, power flows from the will of the people as manifest. Good afternoon from the 17 Newsroom. I'm Alex Fisher. You're watching an NBC News special report on the impeachment trial of President Trump. You can continue watching the trial on our KGET Facebook page. Today the is the final chance for House managers in the trial to make their case against the president and to try and win over at least four Republican senators as they push for more evidence and witnesses and ultimately to remove the president from office. Jay Gray has more from Washington. Hearing no objections, so ordered. As House managers close their opening arguments, their focus is on the second article of impeachment, accusing the president of obstruction of Congress by failing to turn over evidence and threatening to block administration witnesses. President Trump tried to cheat. He got caught. And then he worked hard to cover it up. The president firing back this morning online, posting the impeachment hoax is interfering with the 2020 election. But that was the idea behind the radical left do nothing dim scam attack. They always knew I did nothing wrong. Democrats countering, saying over three days they've meticulously laid out an overwhelming case against the president. You can't trust this president do what's right for this country. This is why if you find him guilty, you must find that he should be removed. While Republicans continue to argue, they've heard nothing new. I challenge anybody here if there was one new piece of information. And that the accusations against the president don't rise to the level of criminal activity or impeachment. And the idea that a politician says he can't serve anymore because he's been so self-centered, I find that to ring hollow. The president's defense team will open their case this weekend. Jay Gray, NBC News, Washington. Hundreds of volunteers hit the streets of Kern County this morning, hoping to get a gauge of the county's homeless population. The annual point in time survey started bright and early at the mission at Kern County. Groups of volunteers fanned out to get the most accurate count possible. After seeing an influx in the homeless population last year, organizers invested in a new tool to track the growing homeless population. Volunteers use an app to record in real time the number of people without permanent shelter. Larry Coleman was one of those volunteers telling us why he came out this morning. 
I really wanted to see the homeless uh, problem firsthand. You know, I read that point in time survey every year, and uh, I thought it was important that I come out and look myself and participate in the process. And it's just awesome that you know 600 some odd people here in Bakersfield and Kern County come out uh, to do this, so that we get an accurate uh, feel for how many people are really in need out there on the street. With a new low barrier homeless shelter site recently approved in Bakersfield, organizers say this year's results could have a major impact on the amount of emergency beds the city needs. A man is recovering after he was hit by a train in East Bakersfield. Emergency crews were called to the tracks at Laguna Seca Way and Oswell Street just before 8 o'clock last night. That's where they found the victim. No word on how he ended up on the train tracks. The sheriff's office says the man suffered injuries to his legs and is expected to survive. We're learning more about the man killed last weekend in Oildale. 33-year-old Roger Archer Jr. was shot to death early Sunday, early Sunday morning at a trailer park on Beardsley Avenue. He died in his father's arms. Last night, those who knew Archer lit candles at a makeshift memorial where he was shot. They also wrote messages for the man they say, despite his own struggles, had a big heart. He had his good days and his bad days, you know what I'm saying, but most of the time he was always helping others. I mean, if he had his last dollar in his pocket and you needed it, he'd give it to you. Archer's half-brother says Archer recently found God and embraced his faith. A GoFundMe page has been set up to help with funeral expenses. You can find a link to it on our website, kget.com. The number of flu-related deaths in Kern County just went up. Public health officials say two more people have died because of the flu. This brings the total to three deaths so far this season. Flu numbers this season are similar to past. Kern Public Health says you can still get a flu shot, and they add it can help with the symptoms of the coronavirus as well. Public Health offers flu shots for $9. A second case of the deadly coronavirus has been confirmed in the U.S. According to the CDC, the patient is a woman in her 60s and is a Chicago resident. Officials say the woman returned from Wuhan, China on January 13th and began experiencing symptoms days later. She is currently hospitalized in isolation and is said to be doing well. Officials continue to say the health threat to the general public is low. You may remember earlier this week, the CDC confirmed a case in Washington state, a man in his 30s. He is still hospitalized, but is said to be doing well. Meantime, China has moved to lock down at least three big cities in an unprecedented effort to contain the deadly virus. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has more from Beijing. Hospitals in Wuhan under-resourced and overwhelmed. People anxious about the mysterious virus that has triggered extraordinary measures across China to contain it. Hospitals appealing for supplies. State media reporting volunteers offering to help. With the number of infected people on the rise and no real end in sight. Health officials are working to pinpoint the source of the virus. Ground Zero, a market in Wuhan, where people could have eaten infected meat or fish. Authorities confirm the virus can be transmitted from human to human through coughing, sneezing, or other personal contact. At least three cities in China on total lockdown. Restrictions extended to seven more. 33 million people affected. And already confirmed cases in at least seven countries, including a man in Washington state who flew in from China last week. Around the world, airports on alert. Passengers screened for symptoms by workers in hazmat suits. While across China, anxiety over the virus is spreading rapidly on social media. Masks are selling out everywhere. In Wuhan, the streets eerily empty, the normally busy train station deserted, the city locked down, isolated and on edge. With so many people unable to leave and an unknown cost to the economy here, there's now growing anger with the government on how they've handled this. So the propaganda is ramping up, trying to strike a positive tone. But that's going to be a hard sell, with the World Health Organization expecting the numbers to rise, and that could mean an expanded restriction zone by the weekend. Guys, back to you. We have breaking news of an, uh, on an update on the deadly stabbing just outside Foothill High School earlier this week. Just a few minutes ago, the sheriff's office confirmed a 17-year-old girl has been arrested. 
KCSO says she was taken into custody in East Bakersfield about 40 minutes ago. That stabbing happened on Tuesday and it was caught on camera and widely spread across social media. 17-year-old Jose Flores died. KCSO already had two people arrested in the case, a 14-year-old and 23-year-old Jason Cruz. Cruz is due in court later today and has been charged with murder. A group of advocates dropped off thousands of signatures to Congressman Kevin McCarthy for paid family leave. It's part of a campaign by Doveman Plus Care for the U.S. to federally mandate paid leave for fathers. Dove spokesman Jordan Lewis was outside McCarthy's office yesterday to drop off the signatures. He says the congressman's office was very receptive to their petition. Congressman McCarthy's office um, agrees that American families are at the heart of American values and we need to put in a policy that is equal and appropriate for all parents. Right now, paid family leave is mandated in California, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and D.C. A family paid leave law for federal workers was passed with last year's spending bill. A local student is said to receive a first place scholarship award in a statewide video contest. This is California. It's filled with special districts. That's a look at the video Urubio Monterosa made that won the competition. Monterosa goes to Independence High School. He will be presented with the $2,000 first place scholarship prize. The annual contest promotes civic engagement and provides students the opportunity to express their creativity while learning about local special districts. Really neat to see. Well, still to come, we're learning more about the three firefighters killed in Australia coming up. What investigators are saying about that crash. Welcome back. Firefighters in Australia held a minute of silence today for three American colleagues killed in a plane crash as investigators began scouring the accident site in remote bushland. NBC's Blaine Alexander has more from Melbourne. The biggest question in all of this still remains, and that is, what exactly was it that caused this massive air tanker to go down? We do know that this was part of a California-based fleet. The parent company, the company that owned the plane, Coulson Aviation, has ordered all of its similar planes to be grounded as this investigation gets underway. But even as this investigation is starting, firefighters, what we've really seen over the past 24 hours or so is this outpouring of grief and just a true show of love for the three firefighters who lost their lives. Overnight, we saw first responders from the U.S. and Canada pausing for a moment of silence to honor the three fallen firefighters. We just um, come together as a family, which we are, uh, when things like this happen and um, try to bolster one another up and and help 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 get through it. Now, even in the midst of all of this, however, firefighters still have a very large task at hand. In fact, overnight, we saw about 40 firefighters come from the U.S., landing here in Melbourne to join the nearly 200 Americans who are already on the ground trying to battle these blazes. Now, I have to say that our team actually just got back from the Sydney area. We spent some time there overnight. And one of the things that was really striking is that even before you walked out of the airport, you could smell the smoke in the air. That just gives you a small glimpse of what these crews are battling against. In Melbourne, Australia, I'm Blaine Alexander, NBC News. Let's take a look at your forecast now with Alyssa Carlson. Started out the morning with patchy fog, 42 degrees, and the, today's normal high is 57. So we are hoping to be a little bit warmer than that as we head throughout the day. High pressure overhead will scour out the cloud cover, and with that being said, we should turn sunny like we did yesterday. And uh, tomorrow morning, watching kind of for a repeat of this morning with another chance of fog in the forecast. And then by Sunday, we'll be looking for a system to work on in here from the west, and that will mix the air out and, of course, reduce any any sort of chance of fog as we head into Sunday and Monday. So let's take a look at the future cast. We should be dry today, tomorrow, and then Sunday now the storm system is looking pretty light here in terms of rain. Maybe a few hundredths of an inch. It's not going to be a huge deal at all. And in terms of snow, we're not even really seeing anything now into Kern County. Higher elevation mountain snow possible into the central Sierra. A couple inches possible at 7,000 feet, which isn't even a big deal uh, as we head into the central Sierra, of course. So here's Sunday night. Now 
looking at the rain all the way out of here into Kern County and Monday looking dry now. So we need the rain, but this weekend system is kind of fizzling on out, I'm afraid. So here we go. Uh, Saturday again looking dry. Sunday morning, 5 a.m., a slight chance of showers. Looks to be eastern Kern County mountains, eastern portion of the valley. And then as we head into Sunday night, more of the same. So we will watch for some clouds around, though, as we head into our Sunday and then again on Monday. Next week, I was thinking maybe a storm system would bring us a slight chance of showers on Wednesday, but now that's also looking like that's not going to happen either. Snow forecast, snow up there near Mammoth, and that will be the heaviest as we head into early next week. And a few hundredths of an inch possible Sunday, otherwise Monday looking dry. So if you are uh, having a getaway Friday, should be a nice day today. 62 degrees here in Bakersfield, 62 in Delano, 62 in Porterville. Watching then for temperatures to be into the lower 60s tonight. Once again, low to mid 40s, so not too terribly cold overnight. Into the mountain sunny skies, 53 in Pine Mountain Club, 57 in Fraser Park, 53 in Bear Valley, 63 in Lake Isabella. Same for Walford Heights, 64 in Kernville, 55 in Tehachapi. 66 degrees in California City today with lows in the upper 30s and lower 40s. As we head into the rest of uh, next week, watching for temperatures to be near 60 degrees. But guess what? We turn that calendar to February 70 for February 1st, 69 degrees for February 2nd, and we may be warmer as we head into the first full week of February. Air quality moderate at 80, no wood burning unless you are registered. Lower 60s on the way as we head into the weekend and then next week week around 60 degrees overnight lows in the mid 40s mountains you'll be at 55 59 on Saturday 54 on Sunday lower 50s as we head into next week overnight lows into the upper 30s Kern River Valley low to mid 60s should be a nice weekend ahead with overnight lows into the mid 40s I'll see you back here again tonight on 17 news at 5 all right thanks Alyssa don't fall for it the convincing scam FedEx is warning people about what you should look out for to make sure your delivery message is legit. Scammers are using those texts to rip you off. NBC's Jolene Kent has more. This morning, cyber criminals are coming for you through your texts, posing as companies you trust. These messages look like legit package delivery updates from FedEx. Our Today Show intern Natalie got one this week. When you saw that, what'd you think? I thought it was legit because my Mac is my new computer is coming tomorrow, so ah. I wanted to set my delivery preference for to come at 11 a.m. But click on the link and you're sent to a bogus Amazon survey. Fill it out and you get a prize. Just enter your credit card info for shipping. And that's how criminals steal your money. It's just like, it's close. It feels personal. It's too personal with the name, with everything, with my computer coming. It, it's too in there. It's too, like, directed at me. This week, FedEx issued a nationwide alert about this scam, tweeting, we do not send unsolicited texts or emails requesting money, package, or personal information. In fact, Americans lost over $2.7 billion to cyber scams in 2018, with crooks contacting you, posing as your bank, the courts, the police, even federal agents. The IRS has seen an increase in tax scams, preying on honest taxpayers. With tax season upon us, the IRS is warning of scammers calling you, claiming to be their agents, saying you owe money and it must be paid back through a gift card or wire transfer. The IRS does not call you about tax debts you owe without first mailing you an official notice. The FTC says its number one fraud complaint, Social Security phone scammers, claiming there's a problem with your Social Security number and demanding payment. Last year, the FBI says more people over 60 reported being victims of these scams than any other age group. But sometimes the crooks pick the wrong victim. Okay, so a sheriff's deputy is going to come here and arrest me? Absolutely. Scammers called this North Carolina police captain posing as social security agents and demanding her personal info or she'd be arrested. Instead of hanging up, she had some fun. The sheriff's department's not coming to get me. I'm pretty sure of that. Jolene Kent reporting. Well, we may be in the middle of winter, but we're already talking about summer. The 2020 Olympics are only six months away, and when we come back, we'll take you to Tokyo, where final preparations are underway. Welcome back. The countdown is on to the Tokyo Olympics. 
Today marks six months until the opening ceremony. The host city celebrated today by lighting the Olympic rings, even a little bit of fireworks there. There's still a lot to do before the Games, but it's not just Tokyo getting ready. Olympic athletes are working hard until the finish line. NBC's Liz McLaughlin has more. The Olympic rings have sailed into Tokyo, where the Summer Games will kick off in six short months, expected to be the biggest Olympics ever. Nearly 9 million fans have already applied for tickets to a record number of events, including four new sports, karate, skateboarding, climbing and surfing. It will be the single most important uh, program change in decades, probably ever. This summer's Olympics may also be the hottest. Officials moving the marathon and race walk events north to Sapporo, even experimenting with artificial snow and sun-resistant pavement to beat the heat. But five-time Olympian and Tokyo hopeful Carrie Walsh says she's not concerned. I don't mind the heat. I think it's kind of mind over matter. 31 athletes have already made it to the Team USA roster, with more than 600 expected to qualify after June's Olympic trials, including decorated Olympians Simone Biles and Katie Ledecky. It's like, oh yeah, it's time to swim fast. It's, you know, I'm ready. Tokyo is ready too, with eight of the city's nine new Olympic venues completed. The athletes' village complex expected to be finished in June, equipped with recyclable cardboard bed frames. Airbnb will also provide Olympic accommodations for the first time, as other partners, including Panasonic, gear up for behind-the-scenes production. We're very excited to bring our audiovisual technologies to the Games in Tokyo this year. Capturing all the action this summer, when the world's attention tunes in to Tokyo. Liz McLaughlin, NBC News. And just a reminder that you can watch the Summer Games only on TV 17. Again, opening ceremonies begin July 24th. When we come back, it is Friday. And you know what that means. We're introducing you to our Pet of the Week. Welcome back. Finally here at noon. If you're a little lonely right now, we may have an option for you. Sorry, it's not Chuck. It's going to be our <laughs> Pet of the Week. Uh, Chuck, who would you bring in today? Well, one of our seniors. This is Pepper. And he's a little chihuahua. And he's between 10 and 11 years old, and what he really wants is just a lap to curl up on and sleep. Okay, we have to say, within minutes of coming here, not even minutes, almost seconds of him coming here, he made himself right at home. And he's, uh, he's a little bit older, yeah. uh, but he seems very calm, and he just kind of very comfortable, very nice, too. Yeah, you know, you want a little buddy, and you yeah. don't, you're not able, or you don't want to have to take him out for walks or whatever. Pepper's the guy. He's going to just be right with you all the time and very easy to take care of. I was going to say, he may, look at him right now. I mean, he's kind of uh, comfortable in your lap and he's, I guess, kind of going to sleep. Yeah. Not very active. Nope. Nope. Not very active. Seems very nice. I mean, he when he uh, came to the studio and everyone was up in his face, you know, he was he was responding well to everyone as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Um, but again, just really wants to be your buddy. He does. He's very, uh, I mean, just a moment ago, he was laying up on your arm, so he wants to be close to you. Yeah. So this is perfect for someone who's wanting to maybe just a, a companion. A, yeah, as yeah. A, as and a pet. there are some people that aren't able to take right. dogs out for walks and everything and all that exercise. Well, Pepper meets that uh, requirement. Is Pepper ready for adoption? He's ready for adoption, can go home today. In fact, we have him all set up in a little playpen right in our lobby. Oh, okay. Uh, so you can just come in the lobby and Pepper will be right there. So even if you just have a few minutes today, you can come and get Pepper. All right, 323-8353 is the number for the SBCA. He is up for adoption. Thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here tonight at 5. 17 News, your local news leader, continues 24 hours a day on KGET.com and our 17 News app in the spirit of the Golden Empire. 17 News.